Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to this UN public lecture to mark the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The hashtag we're using for this event is India Stands for Human Rights, for written as numerical four. So India Stands for Human Rights. It's my pleasure to invite the UN Resident Coordinator and UNDP Resident Representative, Mr. Yuri Afanasiev, to deliver the welcome address. Professor Kutari, uh, Professor Baxi, ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon and, and, and welcome. I think uh, it is uh, remarkable that in just a few days we'll be celebrating the 70th anniversary um, of the Universal Declar Declaration of, of Human Rights. And uh, in one of the early drafts of the, of the Declaration, Article uh, 1 used uh, quite uh, an old-fashioned uh, by today's standards, certainly, a uh, phrase and said, all men are born free um, and equal. And uh, at that time, uh, uh, Dr. Hansa Mehta, an Indian um, woman who was representing the country at the United Nations Human Rights Commission, um, and was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, part of the subcommittee on, on, on drafting uh, the UDHR, um, after numerous negotiations back and forth, it was, I think, very much thanks to her that the final version that we have had on our hands for 70 years actually says um, all human beings are born free and, and equal. It is uh, uh, quite remarkable that um, the history of, of India, in many ways, is the story of standing up for rights and, and freedoms of, of, of people, not only uh, in India, but, but around the world. Um, I think that as a, perhaps a superficial foreigner, um, the history um, or the philosophical roots of Indianness lie in, lie in the traditions of, of resisting um, oppression and colonialism and marginalization and injustice. And, and India has always stood in solidarity with movements um, of justice globally and, and certainly um, in the United Nations fora since its inception. Um, I, I frankly could not think of a better place to celebrate the, the 70th anniversary of the UDHR than, than being here with you all in, in, in Delhi. And uh, I think we could find no better guests to, to um, have a lecture on this topic uh, with us than the combination of, of, of Professor Kotari and, and, and Baxi, both distinguished um, individuals in the area of, of human rights and former special rapporteurs and authors and researchers. And, and when we initially had a discussion about today's lecture, um, I, I received from, from um, Milun uh, uh, an extract of his research um, that he's been doing over, over the last months and I suppose years even, right? And what struck me in, in his research, which will be published as an article and, 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 and hopefully someday as a book, because I think the topic certainly merits it, was a very interesting twist to the history that not only India tremendously influenced both the Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but it did so before it obtained um, independence from its colonial masters, and certainly used it as a tool to attain such independence. And while, you know, if you think back, given that concept um, at the history of, of the world, and certainly of India and its uh, um, role in the United Nations, it kind of, I guess, becomes obvious that, well, it's, it's, a, it's a healthy, it's, it's a natural, thought um, to have had, but I don't know about you, I've never thought about it in those terms, and um, 
which is why I, I, I checked with Milun and I said, Milun, has there been any research on this, asserting this, uh, this topic that, that India used it both as, as, as a kind of a, a universal principle, but also as a tool to help obtain its own independence on, on its own terms. And he said, no, I, I have not found um, such research or su such evidence, and, and we've just also asked Professor Baxi, and, and he said, I also don't remember anything like it, which is why we wanted you to hear in this um, lecture about this very, very interesting research supported by Timeline and uh, and uh, Milun worked in the archives uh, of the UN in Geneva, so what he has on hand is not some assert assertions or, or hypothet hypothetical thoughts. He actually has uh, proof on his hands that this indeed was um, not only a principle, but it was also a strategy that, that India used at that time. And I'm, um, I'm dying to, to hear the lecture in, in, in a few moments and then hear our debate or, or questions on, on the subject. Um, I have to um, say that India, probably uh, among the countries in the South, has the most progressive legislation um, than one can think of in terms of uh, human rights uh, protection. And uh, just uh, the recent law that was passed, uh, as a matter of fact, in, in about 15 days, 14 days, we're going to be uh, arriving at the second uh, anniversary of the last landmark legislation uh, on, on people with disabilities law that is possibly benefiting 250 million Indians um, and rivals some of the legislations uh, you know, in the North and in, in Europe and other countries. Uh, one can, uh, of course, debate whether a lot of this legislation contained in the Constitution or legislative clauses contained in the Indian Constitution and guaranteeing rights for everyone and then in subsequent legislation over the decades, uh, whether its implementation has stood up to the principles that were put uh, when it was formulated. And, and one can have a healthy debate back and forth and I'm sure, like many things in this amazing country, it, it, it has always been three steps forward, two steps back. But I think the idealism of the thought of the Founding Fathers and, and, the, and the vision that they put forward, not only for this country, but for the rest of humanity, is certainly um, worth exploring on an occasion um, such as today. Um, I believe we have reached a stage globally when the, the concept of the indivisibility and interdependence of, of civil, political rights um, on the one hand, and economic and social and cultural rights on, on the other, uh, are no longer a matter of, of debate. And, and uh, right when I was walking here, I, I remembered a long time ago when I was reading uh, Gandhi, I, I, I took a quote from, um, from his writings and, and put it in my, in my phone so I don't forget it. And Gandhi said at that time, which, which, which is an amazingly insightful, um, simple phrase, he said, as long as poverty exists, Freedom is only a wooden loaf. And uh, I think India's position on um, throughout the decades, and including in UN fora, on the indivisibility of the, of the um, socio-economic, political, civil, cultural, and other rights has been um, a fount of strength. I think it's an incredibly objective and, and right way to put uh, and to frame the Universal Declaration. And I think as countries developed, if you think about it, when, when all of these ideas were, were put on paper in, in the original draft, just, just take your, yourself back, you know, 70, 75 years in, into history. Um, you know, racial segregation was uh, still the norm in, in the United States. The colonial empires um, were still very much in existence and only the first ones started shaking and, and crumbling. Um, many, many decades later, apartheid will still be in force in South Africa, and you remember the role India played in, in, in that whole story of, of how it ended. Uh, so, if you think of the forefathers thinking of these concepts at a time where the world was an ugly place, just emerged of a Second World War, uh, 
that took 50 million lives um, in 100 countries. And they were putting these concepts into the Universal Declaration and to the Charter. Frankly, it, is, it was a, an amazing time. Last but not least, as an introduction, um, we are, based on your research, thank you very much for a last minute edition, we are adapting the UN and India um, history. We now have it electronically, by the way, on our website, those of you who haven't seen it, please go. It's, a, it's an interesting timeline with some documents and essays and, and um, some stories by famous Indians who, who worked in the UN. So we have just amended and added two additional uh, slide screen stories that are directly linked with the UDHR and I think it would be also our, our, our fitting way for us in the UN to, to mark the 70th anniversary by bringing this interesting analysis um, to light and to the public consumption. Um, we of course will give you all the credit for discovering this, this new um, area of research and hopefully many other academics and, and, and many other people both in India and elsewhere will look into this and, and take this, um, this, uh, this research forward. Let me, let me stop here and uh, um, hand over to Professor Upendra Baxi. Professor, over to you. Thank you very much. It's very uh, wonderful to be here under the office of the UN and to celebrate the great occasion that is looking ahead. It's very nice to reunite with Milan on this occasion. I discovered when I was making some notes about today that he says, I abbreviated his name, initially. And his initials in bygone era were also initials of a man called Mohandas. You know Mohandas? <laughs> I only call him Mohandas because the word Gandhi is fairly ambiguous politically, otherwise. And um, Dudarshan and uh, many television channels have now uh, done an espionage serial called Entire the Crampton. So both the Initials out for me, I only call him Mohandas. But when I was abbreviating Milan Kothari, and I said, MK, and I said, My God, how am I to introduce this man? Uh, no way I can do that. Uh, but anyway, it's a very nice occasion. Uh, first of all, it's a greeting to all on the UN day that is coming. Uh, but India is particularly poignant because today and yesterday was the day when in Bhopal, Kaza Sophie happened. And 6th of December was the day when the old mosque was vandalized and ultimately fell. And 10th of December is the UN <laughs> Day of Human Rights. It, 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 a series of events in India, one thinks of these days as well. It's a bit sad as well as a joyous day. I'm happy to be here. Now, I'm a, a keeper of your time, I don't know much to do, except to listen, we all have to listen to what fascinating tidbits of history that Melun has discovered, and the rightful contribution <coughs> of India is being celebrated to this particular sculpture, sculpting of human rights, uh, and how, how it related to the making of the Indian constitution, the coeval moment. Well, Excited, we're all excited. Safari, as you promised us to take us, it's going back in time, but it's also contemporary in ways that I'll probably time, I'll elaborate later. So, without much ado, I may, may I request you to I about 50 minutes or 60 minutes, <coughs> and then 30 minutes for discussion, and uh, 10 minutes or less than that for my little chatter. Okay, that's how we divide the time, please. It's a, it's a great honor uh, for all of us, uh, for me particularly, that you agreed to chair this, uh, this session. Um, 
when we were planning uh, the event uh, and Professor Bakshi agreed, um, I, I was quite certain that uh, many, many people would come to hear him. And uh, I see that many of you are here and, and others who are fans and supporters of the UN. So it is wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, I, I want to give you a little bit of a background for the lecture. I uh, um, have been working in human rights for many years and uh, had occasionally come across um, Hansa Mehta's contribution to the UDHR, which is, which is quite well known, uh, which Yuri uh, summarized for you. Um, and I was just very curious to know exactly what she said, um, you know, how the debate went uh, on the issue of gender equality. And I started, I was in Geneva at that time this past summer, and uh, I found uh, uh, three volumes of uh, the Travaux uh, repertoires, <coughs> like the official records of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights uh, debates, which went on for almost two years. Um, and uh, it was a great labor of love for me to read those. I read about 2,000, not 3,000. And uh, I found that not only did Hansa Mehta <coughs> contribute uh, to the paragraph on gender equality to the article, but to many others. And then not only was it Hansa Mehta, but there were a range of other Indians who contributed uh, both indirectly, um, so before the uh, drafting of the Universal Declaration, uh, but also during the declaration and during the different stages at which the declaration was drafted. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, run you through those contributions, but I wanted to first begin uh, with a couple of quotes. Um, and the first one from, um, from uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Um, and he said, I do not want my house to be walled in on all sides and my windows to be stuffed. I want the culture of all lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any. And the second quote is from the uh, preamble of the UDHR, that recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Um, as the lecture progresses, uh, I hope um, you will all um, understand why I started with these two quotes. So India gained independence in 1947 after decades of our freedom struggle uh, brought, to head, um, brought to a head a flurry of resistance at home and advocacy for freedom abroad. The UN was born in 1945 after a remarkable series of global initiatives that began with the birth of the League of Nations in 1920. The culmination of these developments was the adoption in 1948 of what is considered one of the world's greatest living documents, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The UDHR holds the Guinness World Record as the most translated document in the world. I think it's about 300 languages and dialects. It has been called the common language of humanity and the conscience of the world. Desmond Tutu, reflecting on the long struggle against apartheid in South Africa, has written on the 50th anniversary of the UDHR that the UDHR has helped, and I'm quoting, to subvert injustice and oppression. It has helped to open our eyes to the in intrinsic and infinite worth of every individual, but it has also served as a bearer of ideals, a setter of standards according to which governments must be judged." End of quote. So it is not only the dates of the struggle for Indian independence and the institutional build-up towards a world organization, the UN, that coincide. As I posit in this lecture, there is between the birth of India and the UN a remarkable degree of affinity and purpose of ideas, <coughs> concepts, and human rights, which it was hoped at that time would govern the role and behavior of states. The coalescing of ideas and visions between India as a nation and the UN as a global entity was not a coincidence, but a well-planned strategy employed by Jawaharlal Nehru and under the guidance of Mahatma Gandhi. The intention was clear that the pulpit offered by the World Organization would be used to counter British rule and as a forum 
where the freedom of all oppressed people around the world could be articulated and actions determined. So this lecture seeks to contribute uh, scholarship, contribute to the scholarship that uh, is trying to define the contours of this convergence. A great deal of scholarship exists on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but what I found in my research is that a biased view prevails in literature on the UDHR on who were the women and men whose ideas defined the content of the UDHR and from where did they come. I reviewed around 30 books on the UDHR when I was at the library in Geneva and I realized that most of them, of course, almost all uh, written by Western scholars, legal scholars and historians alike, overemphasize the contribution of John Humphrey and René Cassin. The vast majority of books available on the UDHR overlook the significant contributions made by representatives from countries like India, from Lebanon, uh, Charles Malik from China, P.C. Chang from the Philippines, from Chile, and Mexico, among others. There are, of course, exceptions uh, exceptions to this, and there are Western scholars who, uh, who have indeed acknowledged uh, the contribution from the South, and I will be referring to them as the, as the lecture progresses. The other goal of the research, uh, which is something that I've always suspected, but now I have a lot of evidence, was to show that human rights are not a Western concept, they're not a Western ideology, and the UDHR is not a Western instrument that is hoisted on, on all of us around the world. So the lecture will highlight key, uh, the role of key Indians in this quest and the role of key global conferences and the seminal documents that contributed to the drafting of the UDHR and set the stage for the formation of an organization that would represent nations across the world and attempt to give them, give them a voice in a range of intergovernmental and independent bodies um, that continue to contribute even today, to a world in larger freedom, the larger freedom phrase used in the UN in the UN Charter. So I begin with uh, actually going all the way back to the closing year of the the Great War, the First World War, when several attempts were made by world leaders to ensure, through the establishment of standards and institutions, that the sleepwalking that led to a world war would not be repeated. The United States led these efforts through the statements of President Woodrow Wilson, in particular a very famous address called the 14 Points Address to the U.S. Congress that called for the self-determination of peoples and nations around the world. And I'm quoting point five from that um, address where he said that a free, open-minded and absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims based upon a strict observance of the principle that in determining all such questions of sovereignty, the interests of the populations concerned must have equal weight with the equitable claims of the government whose title is to be determined. This was, of course, 14 points that were to contribute to the, the peace settlement uh, in Europe. So he, uh, President Wilson put forward his 14 points in January of 1918. And the time between the announcement of the 14 points until the spring of 1919 is termed as the Wilsonian moment. This is a phrase that was coined by Eris Manila in his book, excellent book, The Wilsonian Moment, Self-Determination and the International Origins of Nationalism. In that book, he, uh, he quotes Hedley Bull, who, who called the Wilsonian moment the, the the expansion of international society. And that moment, uh, in the words of Manila, as I quote, and I quote, launched the transformation of the norms and standards of international relations that established the self-determining nation state as the only legitimate political forum throughout the globe, as colonized and marginalized peoples demanded and eventually attained recognition as sovereign, independent actors in international society, close quote. What Wilson had, what President Wilson had to say struck a chord across the world. In Europe, there were squares, streets, railway stations, and parks that were bearing Wilson's name. Wall, wall posters cried out, we want a Wilson peace. 
In Italy, soldiers knelt in front of his picture. In France, the left-wing paper La Humanité brought out a special issue in which the leading lights of the French left wide with each other to praise Wilson. The leaders of the Arab revolt in the desert, uh, Polish nationalists in Warsaw, rebels in Greek islands, students in Peking, Koreans trying to shake off Japan's control, all took the 14 points as an inspiration. In India, nationalists were also inspired by the Wilsonian moment and formulated claims for self-government in language that resonated with a wider international discourse of legitimacy. Veteran nationalists like Bal Gangadhar Tilak and Lajpat Rai left the confines of the British Empire physically and conceptually to take their case before world opinion. In the 14 points, President Wilson, uh, in the last four, point 14, also proposed and I quote, a general association of nations must be formed under specific covenants for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike, close quote. This idea of a general association of nations was accepted by the nations that were represented at the Paris Peace Conference, which led to the Versailles Treaty, which in 1920 led to the formation of the League of Nations, through the adoption of the Covenant of the League of Nations. Um, and I'm just, uh, so, so the League of Nations uh, also had delegates from India. Uh, and and I'm just, this is a, one of the delegations. Uh, I don't exactly know. I think it's the, the um, Nawab of Bikaner, the second from the left. Uh, the delegations were led, led by princes from different parts of India, and uh, there was a caricaturist at, uh, in Geneva, uh, a Swiss man who made uh, portraits, and this is uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singhji of Navanagar. Uh, the princes uh, made significant contributions, but they were also known uh, for, of course, for their um, colorful attire, but also for the, for the amazing dinner parties that they threw while they were in Geneva. But um, what is very interesting about the Indian representation at the League of Nations, um, even though the, the delegations were chosen by the British, but the Indian delegations in their speeches, when you look through the, the, the material, the primary material, um, spoke in guarded but clear terms about the limits of empire and the relevance of an international body that would speak for the world's people. A number of important Indian personalities Played, that were to play key diplomatic roles for India uh, in the decades to come following the League, received important experience at the League. Girija Shankar Bajpai, Ramaswamy Mudaliar, um, Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, amongst, amongst others. And in fact, they contributed to India um, attaining an international pers personality as a nation long before we gained independence. Uh, and this, this is very important. So the League of Nations was formed, of course, as a result of the initiative of President Wilson and other world leaders. But the politics and self-interest of nations and the emergence of leaders like Adolf Hitler led to the demise of the League of Nations. It is, however, without doubt that, um, that the United Nations that uh, came following the League uh, and we have today was the fruition of the platform of global dialogue that the League established. The United States is a legacy of the ideas and methods of work that was established by the League. I'll just give you one example. The League had um, something called mandates, where they looked at areas where there was um, there were conflict between countries and territorial conflicts, and that then transferred into what became the Trusteeship Council under the UN General Assembly, which led the decolonization process uh, for for many decades. Um, and when you look at the work of the League um, in, in detail, uh, it, I, I would actually strongly argue that with people who say that the League was a failure. It was not. It made a major contribution from which we are still uh, benefiting today. Those of you who are interested in the overview of the beginning and end of the League of Nations, I would highly recommend a book by Susan Pedersen, uh, which was released last year, published last year, called The Guardians. The League of Nations and the Crisis of Empire. <laughs>
In India, at that time, both uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru regretted that the Western powers had not seized on the Wilsonian moment and that they had squandered the opportunity afforded by the League of Nations to create a global body that could work for the benefit of all, whether independent or oppressed peoples across the world. Of course, at the time of these developments, um, India was firmly under British rule, which severely limited uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru's roles as leaders able to play a global role. Hence, the opportunity that was offered uh, later on by the San Francisco Conference, uh, which led to the drafting of the UN Charter um, for Mahatma Gandhi and Nehru was an opportunity not to be missed. They sought in these, this global meeting to link India's struggle for freedom from the yoke of colonialism to the freedom of all oppressed people. So in the years preceding uh, the adoption of the UN uh, Charter, I have to mention also that there were two important events that contributed to the formulation of principles that would um, contribute to the creation of a new international order. Uh, president Roosevelt, um, another American president, in his State of the Union Address, 1941, proposed four freedoms. And he said that there should be, free in, this is 1941, freedom of speech and expression, freedom of, of every person to worship God in his own way, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. These principles were to play a very important role in the conceptual development of the UDHR. Um, whether these principles were originally from President Roosevelt, um, I am not so sure. There's, there's not that much writing on it, but I will come back to this in the lecture because um, in, in, in many ways, when you summarize uh, the, the wisdom and learnings from both Hinduism and Buddhism, you come across uh, very similar principles. So on the 1st of January 1942, 47 countries, including India, signed the declaration by the United Nations, which formed the basis of the discussions uh, resulting in the, in the UN Charter. And uh, in October 45, the Charter was adopted. At the San Francisco Conference, um, the Indian delegation was led by Sir Arkot Ramaswamy Mudalier, who signed the UN Charter on behalf of India. Here he is signing the Charter. Um, but what happened before the adoption of the Charter is of great interest to us, and I think is very, very significant for what followed with the drafting of the Universal Declaration. Mahatma Gandhi um, issued a press release some months before the San Francisco Conference, and uh, he and, I, and uh, I will quote, um, while the All India Congress Committee must, he quoted from uh, AICC resolution uh, from August 1942, which said, and he said in the statement directed at San Francisco, that while the AICC must primarily be concerned with the independence and defense of India in this hour of danger, the committee is of the opinion that the future peace, security, and ordered progress of the world demands a world federation free nations, and on no other basis can the problems of the modern world be solved. Such a world federation would ensure the freedom of its constituent nations, the prevention of aggression and exploitation by one nation over another, the protection of national minorities, the advancement of all backward areas and peoples, and the pooling of the world's resources for the common good of all. An independent India, he said, would gladly join such a world federation and cooperate on an equal basis with other countries in the solution of international problems. And he said, thus the demand of Indian independence, for Indian independence is in no way selfish. Its nationalism spells internationalism. Remember the quote I began with. Um, this was a very, very important statement. And those of you who are interested in knowing more, um, there is a very valuable reflection about Mahatma Gandhi's inspiring balance between intense nationalism and his world outlook in Jawaharlal Nehru's um, the discovery of India. So here are the great men. The, the photograph on the left is Gandhiji Nehru, uh, Abdul Kalam Azad. Uh, this is in Varda in 1935. One on the right is Gandhiji Nehru and uh, Abdul Ghaffar Khan in the back. You can see uh, 1939 also in Varda after 
some meetings of the Congress. Um, but at San Francisco, um, the biggest impact uh, was was uh, not made by there was an official delegation, but but it was not an official Indian delegate who made the biggest impact. But uh, it was made by Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, who was in the middle of a one-year tour of the United States. In the months leading up to the San Francisco conference, Pandit embarked on an extensive lecture tour, tour of the U.S. And the views expressed um, in, these, in the lectures that she gave across the country uh, summarized the worldviews of, of Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, that the freedom of India was a, was a precondition to the freedom of the world's oppressed and colonized people. And Pandit's lectures drew large crowds, including civic leaders from across the US society. Her views resonated powerfully with the African American leadership that was for some that was some years later to inspire Martin Luther King and his crusade for the emancipation of black people uh, in the US. And she, Pandit found a powerful um, resonance amongst the African American groups who then in fact, supported her call at the San Francisco conference uh, demanding India's freedom. In a memorandum submitted to the conference, Pandit outlined the positions of Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, who both saw in the global conferences uh, course opportunities to expose gross justice of uh, British occupation. Pandit, uh, Madam Pandit submitted a statement to the San Francisco Conference as a member of the Indian National Congress Party and as a spokesperson for the civil society groups at the conference. And in her um, hope for a successful outcome of the conference, she drew, a, drew attention of the delegates to the problem of India. And I quote, the voice of some 600 million enslaved people of Asia must not be officially heard at this conference and those who have, may not be officially heard at this conference and those who have usurp their birthright freedom may cynically claim to speak for them, but there will be no real peace on this earth so long as they are denied justice. Recognition of India's independence now will be a proclamation and assurance to the whole world that the statesmen of the United Nations assembled at this solemn conclave in San Francisco have in truth and honor heralded the dawn of a new era and a better day for all but crucified, but the crucified humanity. So uh, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit's remarkable performance during her one year stay in the US, uh, and of course encapsulated the essence of the lessons learned from India's ongoing freedom struggle. But the alliances that, uh, that she built uh, during that trip with Eleanor Roosevelt, with the African American leaders, with the public and the media, uh, created solid ground based on human rights and social justice, and she achieved the solidarity and earned respect and admiration <coughs> for India's freedom struggle and the messages that the ongoing struggle represented. All this hard work that uh, she did for that year was to pay remarkable dividends, as we will see later on in this lecture, not only for India, but for the foundations on which the United Nations was built. Um, so the UN Charter, of course, has its weaknesses. Um, it was not exactly what our leaders would have wanted, uh, but it still contained uh, provisions on, um, on human rights. But there was an attempt by the Allied powers to still create a, a compromised organization where the big powers continued to control the world with a lighter but firm version of colonialism. India, on the other hand, uh, wanted a global body where all countries of the world, including the ones that would gain independence in the decades following the adoption of the UDHR, were equal. And, and so they, they, they strove for that. Um, and, and in the expressions of the Indian leaders, uh, these were the same human rights as those characterized the Indian um, freedom struggle as brilliantly articulated in uh, the Quit India resolutions and in the drafting process uh, during the Constituent Assembly. So the messages that were carried um, by India's representatives, Hansa Mehta, M. R. Masani, and Lakshmi Menon, I'll come to each one of them, uh, to the UDHR framing process for the freedom of humankind from oppression of all kinds was the same as the independent movement message. So the collective voice of the Indian delegates therefore called for an independent India and an independent global body free from the interference of a colonized power for India and free 
from the duplicitous games that the Allied powers, the UK of course being common in both, uh, for the United Nations. So the worldview of Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru um, honed through decades of the freedom struggle and the experience, and indeed the resonance that Vijayalakshmi Pandit gained on her visit would all converge into, a, into the powerful messages that the Indian delegates contributed to the various articles um, of the UDHR. Uh, this is a slide of uh, Vijayalakshmi Pandit addressing the General Assembly. So immediately following uh, the San Francisco conference, India decided to move uh, very rapidly at the UN. And uh, at the UN General Assembly session in 1946, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru um, sent Vijay Lakshmi back uh, as the head of the delegation, and India um, attempted to have a resolution passed on South Africa, on the apartheid in South Africa, and particularly the racism that uh, Indians in South Africa, uh, in the South Africa, faced. There was fierce opposition from the Western nations, um, but India managed uh, to have the resolution adopted. And that resolution then opened up uh, a completely new perspective through which countries could no longer hide behind their uh, nation's boundaries and continue to violate human rights without facing a global challenge, um, without facing a challenge that would be championed by the, universal, uh, by the UN General Assembly. Before we get to the UDHR, um, I will go to the UDHR. Um, a number of contributions from professional associations and international agencies were made to assist the drafting process of the Universal Declaration prior to the actual formal drafting. Of all, on, of, all of these, uh, two contributions stand out, uh, both for their insightfulness and for the contributions made by uh, Indians. In, um, the first is a global survey um, on the theoretical basis for the rights of man that was carried out by UNESCO. Um, as a possible contribution to the drafting of the UDHR, the Director General of the newly created um, UNESCO, Dr. Julian Huxley, circulated a memorandum and a questionnaire to 150 eminent thinkers across the world, uh, philosophers, leaders, others, academics, the attempt was to solicit opinions on the utility of a universal instrument of human rights and whether different conceptions of human rights could be reconciled into a single universal document. Um, and uh, this is a letter that, uh, um, of course, Julian Huxley wrote to Jawaharlal Nehru, um, and in that he stated that it's very important to have contributions from men like yourself who have thought about these problems. And in that letter, he also requested um, Nehru to, to see if uh, Mahatma Gandhi would himself uh, respond. Um, Pandit Nehru responded to Dr. Huxley's letter, expressing regret that he could not respond because he said, uh, remember this is just a few months before our independence, he said, we have to face very difficult and intricate problems in India and I have the misfortune to be tied up with these problems, but he, he promised to bring the letter, uh, Huxley's letter to uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, attention. What I find remarkable, uh, these are from the archives of UNESCO um, in Paris. What I find remarkable is that uh, India was three months away from becoming independent, uh, and, and the fact that Pandit Nehru, uh, and you will see Mahatma Gandhi, took the trouble to reply to Julian Huxley is surely an indication that the success of the United Nations and the framing of global standards was of great importance to both Pandit Nehru and, uh, and Gandhi. Uh, in a related letter, uh, Sarva Pelli, um, Brother Krishnan, who was working at UNESCO at the time, uh, thanked Julian Huxley for his letter and proposed names of Indians who could make a contribution uh, to this process by UNESCO. Uh, the UNESCO publication, which came out in 1949, which was an edited version of the contributions received from around the world, contains the contributions of three Indians. Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Humayun, Professor Humayun Kabir, and Professor S. V. Puntam Bekar. Um, and here is Mahatma Gandhi's letter, which was written on a train. Uh, he was arriving uh, by train, uh, I don't exactly know from where, but to Delhi. And, uh, 
it was, it, it was written in the form of a letter to Dr. Huxley. And the letter contains one substantive paragraph, which, which is very, um, uh, which was very indicative of the, the nature of contribution India wanted to make to the global um, standard setting process. And I quote, this is the second part there. I learned from my illiterate but wise mother that all rights to be deserved and preserved come from duty well done. Thus, the very right to live accrues to us only when we do the duty of citizenship of the world. From this one fundamental statement, perhaps it is easy enough to define the duties of man and woman and correlate every right to some corresponding duty to be first performed. Every other right can be shown to be a usurpation hardly worth fighting for. This was Gandhiji's contribution, and, and it contributed, uh, I will come to that, to um, an article in the UDHR on, on uh, responsibilities and duties. But the second contribution um, that I'm referring to by Professor Puntambekar um, it was titled The Hindu Concept of Human Rights. Uh, Professor Puntambekar at that time, uh, the political scientist, was head, head of the Department of Political History and Science at the Hindu University in, in Benares. And in his contribution, he stated that human rights require as counterparts human virtues or controls. To think in terms of freedoms without corresponding virtues would lead to a lopsided view of life and a stagnation or even a deterioration of personality, and also to chaos and conflicts in society. And he summarizes in his response the early thinking of, of Hinduism and uh, of Buddha. And he says that they have propounded a code as it were of ten essential human freedoms and controls or virtues necessity for good life. They are not only basic but more comprehensive in their scope than those mentioned by any other modern thinker. They emphasize five freedoms or, or social assurances and five individual possessions or virtues. And the five social freedoms are freedom from exploitation, freedom from violation or dishonor, freedom from early death and disease, and the five individual possessions or virtues are absence of intolerance, compassion or fellow feeling, knowledge, freedom of thought and conscience, and freedom from fear and frustration or despair. Um, and now you can see whether President Roosevelt uh, also had learned from this very ancient wisdom from India. So a different but not incompatible perspective was contributed by Professor Humayun Kabir, who uh, in, a, in a contribution titled Humayun, uh, Human Rights, the Islamic Tradition and the Problems of the World Today. Uh, Humayun Kabir was a poet and a philosopher, and at that time was with the Department of Education, uh, Government of India. And in his contribution, he challenges the Western conceptions of human rights. And he says, since it applied only to Europeans and sometimes to only some among Europeans. And um, he argued that such, that to a large extent, um, such conceptions of human rights have receded from the theory and practice of democracy that was set up by early Islam, in which, which succeeded in overcoming the distinction of race and color to an exp extent experience neither before nor since. And in his contribution, he calls for a new charter of human rights, where he lists uh, four rights, food and clothing, housing, education, uh, medical services, and says that, uh, that the UDHR should confine itself to the definition of the content of these rights um, and the degree of control and interference permitted to the state for securing them. Literature on the origins of the UDHR is divided as to the extent um, that the remarkable exercise undertaken by UNESCO contributed to the content of the UDHR. What is not in doubt, however, is that the responses from diverse religion, religious, cultural, and philosophical traditions confirm that in spite of their differences, there exists universally accepted principles and values that could be expressed in a global document. And they also confirm that the, the, the colossal crisis and devastation that the world faced at that time, that the ethical and moral necessity of a troubled world required that differences, religious and ideological differences, would be put, si put aside in the common struggle for a just world. <laughs>
The other contribution before the UDHR was made by the American Law Institute, uh, which prepared something called the Essential Elements of Human Rights, where they also gathered together experts from around the world to contribute to the UDHR process. And this is a very important uh, statement because it, it actually brings together um, economic, social, and cultural rights and civil and political rights. An Indian was also a member uh, of that uh, committee that drafted this statement. Uh, his name was K.C. Mahindra. But unlike Kahansa Mehta and Vijayalakshmi Pandit and others, he was not, he was an industrialist. He was in the U.S. Um, in, in a, leading an India supplies mission. Uh, but he did contribute. I have not been able to find his notes, so I don't know exactly what he said. But it's important that he was there. And, uh, and of course, we know after he came back to India, he set up the Mahindra company. But he was, his, his life and work were nevertheless imbued with a strong sense of social justice. And he, of course, set up the Mahindra Trust, which is one of the few philanthropic trusts uh, still existing uh, in India. So um, finally, we come to the UDHR. Um, and uh, this is Eleanor Roosevelt with a final copy of the UDHR. Uh, in, in May of 1946, the Economic and Social Council of the UN created a commission on human rights composed of members from 18 countries. Um, India was a member of the first commission, which was tasked, which was charged with the task of drafting an international bill of rights. Opening the session of the commission, the Assistant Secretary General of the UN, Henry Lohier, uh, stated that, and I quote, the action taken in the case of South Africa established a precedent of fundamental significance in the field of international action. For out of these debates, the general impression has had risen up that no violation of human rights should be covered up by the principle of national sovereignty. So we can see how much of India's work in San Francisco and with the South Africa resolution actually cleared the way um, for the drafting of the UDHR unencumbered encumbered by the threats of the politics of colonialism and the recourse that states could take under the guise of sovereignty. Uh, the UDHR itself was uh, drafted uh, in different stages over a period stretching from January 47 to December 10th, December 1948, and next Monday we celebrate 70 years of that. Um, I'm not going to go through that, uh, but if those of you are interested in the different drafting stages, and the different bodies in the UN involved in that, um, I would refer um, to the remarkable book by Johannes Morsink, titled The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Origins, Drafting, and Intent. Um, so, Hansa Mehta, she's uh, meeting Eleanor Roosevelt, represented India uh, at the commission and made a series of remarkable substantive contributions to many of the articles that made up the Universal Declaration. Um, she was well placed to play this important role. Hansa Mehta had already represented India um, in the subcommittee on the status of women in '46. She was, of course, a member of the UN of the Indian Constituent Assembly. Uh, freedom fighter had been worked closely with Mahatma Gandhi, had been to jail, um, and in fact was very well versed with um, with uh, human rights and, and both in terms of her own experience, but also in terms of drafting. Uh, being a member of the Constituent Assembly. At the eighth meeting of the Commission, Mehta um, asked for consideration of, the draft, of a draft resolution that had been submitted by India to the Commission. And India's contribution uh, to the drafting of the Declaration contained a number of rights, freedom of opinion, freedom of assembly and association, the right of access to the UN without risk of reprisal, right of equality, right to work, right to health. Uh, and actually the commission at its 10th meeting decided that one of the bases for the work on the UDHR would be the contribution uh, of India, uh, from India. So uh, in addition to Han Hansa Mehta, who was the longest standing member uh, of the commission that drafted the declaration, there were a number of other Indians, uh, including MR, uh, Masani, and Lakshmi Manan. And what I'm going to do in the last uh, left minutes of the presentation today is summarize for you um, different articles of the UDHR where India <coughs> made a significant contribution. Um, the first was, of course, India's approach um, of secularism. Um, 
Um, in Article 1, the, the initial draft of Article 1 of the UDHR, um, of course, took language from the American Declaration of Independence and the French Declaration. But what sets the UDHR apart uh, from these earlier declarations uh, and this reformulation that happened in the drafting process has been critical to the evolution of human rights is the omission of God as the source from which human rights derive. Uh, the struggle in the deliberations, therefore, was, uh, as Morsink has noted, how to resolve the bargain about God and uh, God and nature. Um, the Indian position was made clear in its resolution and in the debate that uh, that took place. Uh, those of you who are interested in the in the uh, this um, tension between the epistemic and natural rights, uh, I would again recommend I would recommend another book by Johannes Morsink called Inherent Human Rights: Philosophical Roots of the Universal Declaration. So, in the process of the debate. Um, the word God was removed from earlier drafts. Uh, instead, the members of the commission agreed on the use of the phrase by nature and by conscience. Uh, and a number of representations made, were made, first by uh, Ansa Mehta and then by Lakshmi Menon. Um, what's Lakshmi Menon? Uh, and and uh, at the third committee, when the declaration was taken up, um, some members uh, uh, representing Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela um, insisted on, re uh, wanted to reinstate the word God. And Lakshmi Menon said at that meeting, uh, although different, and I quote, although different countries had different beliefs and political systems, they shared the same ideals of social justice and freedom. The purpose of the declaration was to, was to set forth those ideals and to find a basis of agreement acceptable to all. Um, and she said in that connection, lesson, lessons could be learned from the democracies of both the East and the West. And as an amendment submitted by the Brazilian representative to reinstate God contained a statement of belief which was not shared by all representatives, she appealed to him to withdraw it, withdraw it for the sake of unanimity. So the Indian position was, was upheld, uh, and God was removed, and this is the final text of Article 1. Um, and you will also notice that um, the word nature was also taken out and then it said reason and conscience. Um, the second major contribution was also on this article. Um, in um, Article 1, Yuri referred to that. So the initial draft of Article 1 actually said that all men are free and equal, are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And uh, Mehta in immediately um, stated um, that she did not like the wording all men, and uh, also the phrase, and should act towards one another like brothers. She felt that this would be interpreted to exclude women, and was in fact out of date. Um, but the CHR, the Commission on Human Rights, initially adopted the article without acknowledging the point made by Meta, and a debate on this point ensued. It's interesting that Eleanor Roosevelt, in fact, uh, said that in her understanding, men used in this sense was generally accepted to include all human beings. But India, of course, persisted. Um, Mehta per persisted with her position. Uh, she was supported uh, in, her, in her work by, by the UN Subcommission on the Status of Women, uh, which was an observer at the deliberations, but had also submitted its own context. And here is Sansa Mehta with the members of the, of the subcommission. And, uh, and when it came to the General Assembly, the third committee of uh, the General Assembly, Lakshmi Menon also supported the uh, change of the language. And so the final adopted article said all human beings instead of uh, all men. The third uh, major contribution of India um, was on the question of the indivisibility of all human rights. And I'm referring to one article in, in particular. Um, and, and I mean, generally, the, the UDHR broke a new ground in 1948 with the equal recognition of economic, social, cultural, and civil and political rights. Um, delegations from communist, socialist countries contributed to the inclusion of ESC rights, economic, social, cultural rights in the UDHR. India played an important role uh, also in this regard. 
So for example, on the discussions on the right to health, the right to work, the right of rights of mothers and children uh, illustrates the type of role uh, India played. So the, um, the first draft of the article on uh, standard of living and health um, stated that everyone has a right to a uh, standard of living adequate for health and well-being including security in the event of unemployment, disability, old age, or lack, other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. During the discussions, uh, Mehta referred to the original contribution from India and stated that it's very important to have, uh, in fact, a separate paragraph that recognizes the right to help of mothers and, and children. And, and that formulation that uh, Mehta presented um, was later included, and so the final article 25 has uh, the second, the motherhood and child, childhood are entitled to special care and assistance. All children, whether born in or out of wedlock, shall enjoy the same social protection. The other article, which I consider to be absolutely uh, phenomenal in terms of India's contribution, and, and is, is fundamental to all human rights instruments that have followed the UDHR, um, is Article 2 on non-discrimination. Um, so Article 2 on non-discrimination um, had uh, this text that was submitted uh, earlier draft. It said, everyone is entitled to the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. At that time, there was, um, it had uh, recently has been set up a subcommission on the prevention of discrimination and protection of minorities in the UN. So the Commission on Human Rights referred the draft to the subcommission as an expert body. And we had a member at that sub subcommission. His name was M.R. Masani. Uh, some of you may have heard his name. He was a member of the Satantra Party, participated in the freedom struggle, uh, and also was a member of the, of the Constituent Assembly along with Ansa Mehta. So Masani vigor vigorously took up the issue of the inclusion of color. And, and stated that race does not include color. Um, the subcommission had a long debate and in fact agreed to, they wanted to keep this language and just put a footnote where race is to say, well, race does not include color. Uh, Masani, of course, insisted that it should be in the text itself. Masani took up a second proposal, which said that, that discrimination based on political opinion has also to be a criteria. And he um, and, and uh, there was a lot of opposition, uh, primarily from the USSR, uh, which was afraid of what the, the minorities in the USSR would do. Um, India insisted on that inclusion. Again, it went up. Uh, Hansa Mehta took it up, and um, both uh, the words "color" and uh, "political opinion" uh, finally made it into the non-discrimination article. This is a very, very important, uh, important contribution um, that India made. Um, if you can read the full text, I think all of you have the small book like this. Um, I'll do one more article if I can. <laughs> what, seven minutes. How many minutes? Seven. Seven. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, freedom of movement. Uh, the initial draft stated that. Everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his country. Uh, Ansa Mehta, just back from the debates, vigorous debates at the Constituent Assembly in India, said that there's something missing here. If everyone has a right to leave their country, uh, shouldn't everyone have a right to freedom of movement in their own country? And there was a lot of opposition. There were many countries there who didn't want their populations to be moving around as they pleased. Um, and uh, the debate went on for a long time, again supported by Indians throughout the process, and finally the DHR. And in fact, Indians said that should be the first right. So everyone has the right to freedom of government um, and residence within the borders of each state. So throughout the deliberations during the creation of the Universal Declaration, the Indian delegation distinguished themselves by consistently stressing the principles of multiculturalism and cosmopolitanism. Um, 
Mehta, Masani, Lakshmi Menon all stressed at different stages of the discussions that the UDHR had to apply to everyone in the world. And earlier in the deliberations, Hansa Mehta carried forward a core message of India's freedom struggle as articulated in words and actions by Mahatma Gandhi and stated that such a bill of human rights must be simple, forthright document which is easily understood. She wanted a document which was meant for peoples of the world, not for uh, lawyers and academics. And, and that prevailed, as you see, the UDHR is quite simply drafted. Um, so the Indian delegation played an important role in in many of these uh, cases, I have not been able to go through all of them. India was also very active on the issue of, uh, of self-determination, on the issue of, um, of petition, saying that if you have a universal declaration, there should also be a right to petition. We didn't succeed in that. Um, but uh, as you can see, we played an important role. So in conclusion, um, I would like to say that it's very clear that Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, Hansa Mehta, Amar Masani, Lakshmi Menon uh, were all freedom fighters in the most uh, radical sense, scholar activists. Uh, and what set them apart um, was their practical and moral approach to the content of the UDHR. The Indian delegates demonstrated a remarkable degree of magnanimity, forbearance, perseverance, and foresight in their written and oral contributions towards the formation of the UDHR. They were able to translate into words and action lessons learned from decades of the freedom struggle and to transpose the language learned from the articulation of human rights and freedoms that were express, expressed in the historic resolutions adopted at the Indian National Congress meetings in Karachi and Lahore in the Quit India Resolution and in the drafting that already took place during the first year of the Constituent Assembly. And they were able to convey very powerfully, the worldview and demands for the emancipation of all oppressed people um, conveyed in the speeches and writings of Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, but of course, learned from their own lessons as being active part participants in India's freedom struggle. In the decades following the adoption of the UDHR, Indian delegates continued their active contribution, including pushing for the two covenants, including pushing for um, complaint mechanisms, and a global governance system that stood up for human rights and social justice. Um, and I just want to show you a very quick clip of a session of the, uh, of the Commission on Human Rights. Um, All and still have faith that the majority of the people will be right. I think it's always a very encouraging thing and one that we in the Human Rights Commission uh, must have tremendous faith in because there is no sound it's an archive this is René Cassin from France uh, this is Charles Malik from Lebanon who made a major major contribution uh, and he actually chaired the final session when the declaration was adopted um, there's Hansa Mehta And uh, this is a, uh, part of the same session. I cannot say that I feel as exhilarated as I did when we adopted the draft Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We have not found solution on some of the fundamental points. The measures of implementation are not adequate. Uh, this was a session in 1952, but India continued its work, as I mentioned, push for a um, uh, petition process in the UN, uh, to push for decolonization, uh, in a push for freedom in, a, in South Africa, in, uh, you know, for, for Palestine, all the way up to the armistice in Korea, and of course to have the two covenants and, and it's one, India is one of those countries that really contributed to the recognition of self-determination in the two covenants that were adopted um, in the 1960s. Um, so I, I will close by um, uh, just stating that after the adoption um, of the UDHR, um, it was embraced in India uh, very much in 1948. And in, in an interview that Hansa Mehta gave in 69, she said, and I quote, it was a very good experience because I was at that time on the fundamental rights committee of our constituent assembly, 
So I could compare the UN human rights and also the Indian fundamental rights. The elaboration of the fundamental rights in the Indian constitution was thus linked to the UDHR. The UDHR, of course, continues to con consistently form, inform judgments of the Indian Supreme Court. It has been translated into 33 Indian languages and has become a powerful pedagogical tool for human rights education. Major challenges, however, remain. Uh, neither the UN nor India have lived up to the vision, visionary potentials, potential that the founders of these two entities envisaged. The ideas, principles, and foundational postulates are, are however, there to be recast into policies today, uh, as briefly sketched in this lecture. Uh, if any country is destined to pick up the torch of human rights, social justice, and peace, it is India. And as Indians, uh, we owe it to the legacy, the great legacy of our freedom struggle, and those great leaders, including Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, who led the movement of the United Nations for all. The past, present, and future of India and the UN are intertwined in what should be a seamless thread. It is, however, an open question as to whether India has the vision and the leadership to pick up the mantle of a world governed in larger freedom by a multilateral organization. So the challenges the world faces today, racism and growing xenophobia, economic imperialism, narrow nationalism, are not too dissimilar from the devastation caused by the world wars, colonialism and imperialism that left at that time the world to deal with. So we need to once again recast the country and the UN as harbingers of a more humane world, governed um, by respect for human rights and compliance with international human rights commitments. The contours of what uh, may constitute such a world are there in the debates that led to the UDHR. And the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration compels us once again to revisit the incredible repository of knowledge and wisdom that is available in the debates to the UDHR. The pragmatism that led to the UDHR um, was based on, on, a, on a world that would be governed by peace and human rights. Uh, the pragmatism today is based on efficiency, realism, security, inward-looking nationalism. But we all need to go back to those debates and, um, and work towards a more humane world. Thank you very much. President of the UN, UN General Assembly, and I leave you with uh, the two great men. Uh, perhaps we can imagine that they're laughing about uh, the adoption of the South Africa regime. Despite the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the two covenants, yet 
the process of dehumanization of the human race continues. The vast majority of the human race are looked upon by those in positions of power and wealth as objects, as commodities, as pieces of amusement. So to me, I recall the, uh, the uh, picture of the Sphinx, which you know has a body of an animal and the face of the human being. So now the planetization process is happening, will humanity or human being emerge out of that animal state and manifest its true face of spirituality, of reason, of moral conscience, of justice, and establish peace. So that seems to be a great challenge. Well, I'm a merchant with the Baha'i community and as a social worker involved in a number of activities. May I have the occupation to make a, a small comment rather than a question? It's actually to, to take my name with Nehal. I worked with the United Nations for many years, and uh, I just want to thank the Guru and Dr. Bakshi for this wonderful opportunity. May I just take a small point about the apartheid revolution of 46 and Mrs. Pandit, how she introduced it and what happened. Uh, when she raised the question of taking up the issue of colored people, as was then known in 1946, General Smuts, who of course knew Gandhiji very well and was fond of him, a mutual friend from South Africa, General Smuts sent a desperate message to be their action, saying, Madam Pandit, please don't pursue this matter. It will be contrary to Article 27 of the Charter, which says that matters intrinsically within the domestic jurisdiction of the state should not be the subject of intervention. And Mrs. Pandit was quite firm that the matter should not be dropped. So she sent the message to Panditji, her brother, saying, what should I do? Gandhiji's friend is telling me not to take this matter forward. He says it heard Article 270 of the Charter, what should I do? So Panditji got in touch with Gandhiji, who sent back a message via Panditji to his sister to tell General Swartz, there are some offenses that are so grave that they should not be protected by Article 270 of the Charter. And the fate of colored people in South Africa is one such. So if you forgive me, my friend, we must pursue this matter regardless. I wanted to mention this too because there's history there. Since very often since then, countries, including our own, have argued that Article 27 of the Charter protects them from international comment and observation. That's, of course, contrary to what the whole regime of human rights is about. And on three occasions, our country has led the charge after the apartheid revolution to deal with the issue. In the case of the Bangladesh War, when we said the matter of self-defense, but also rights, then in the case it was followed after by the Vietnamese throwing out in Cambodia when they were there, and then Tanzania brought down Idi Amin on the basis of what we've done in Bangladesh in 71. I just mentioned this because there's a, there's a link there between the way Article 27 has been treated and the further of India in 46 when it brought the anti kind of people. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, just a quick uh, a historical question. Uh, I'm wondering if in the record, um, when you were studying the archives, what was the dynamic between the great powers or the allies, um, allies coming out of the war? And specifically, the 18, I think, there were members, right, um, in, in the drafting committee, and specifically India as the biggest um, country um, in the South that was participating. I just, it, did you get a feel of, because look, it, it, all of this was done in the late 40s, 43, 
was uh, Tehran, uh, right, where the, 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 the big chessboard was discussed and crafted and, and lines were drawn in the sand and territories were swapped and people were exchanged, on paper at least. And at the same time, this was happening. So what was the dynamic? You respond to my question. So my question comment was about this. But it's very, very important. Thank you. Uh, would you like to... Yeah, one or two more and then go back to the people. Yeah, yeah. Steve. Uh, thank you, Ben, and thank you, Milun, for an outstanding presentation. On the 20th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I went to work for René Cassin, and he sent me to Beirut to interview and chat with Shaw Malik. And uh, throughout my conversations with both men, you know, and throughout my work with Cassin and my subsequent work at UNESCO, I was fascinated, like you, with the non-Western inputs into the UDHR. And I think that your scholarship will provide guidance for many people in the future about this. I would also, I want to leave this now to something provocative and to a question, obviously, or else I wouldn't have taken the microphone. Um, having been through all of this and having myself attempted to understand the diverse contributions to the UDHR and to relativize the role of John Humphrey and René Cassin. And I think in the case of Cassin, certainly there was a certain acknowledgement in at least my personal conversations with him of the essential role played by others. But what are we observing now? We're observing now my country, represented at the United Nations by a woman of Indian origin, who, in the very city where you were doing your research, gave that speech you probably attended, in which she announced to the world that yes, the United States has a heritage of human rights, but human rights do not come from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or treaties. They come from God. So there was a big step backwards. She was quite eloquent. I will acknowledge that to Nikki Hayden. And then, subsequently, of course, the United States withdrew from the Commission on Human Rights. An enormous step backwards. I consider her reinstating God as the foundation of human rights as a, a minor point. Nobody's going to notice that in history, and it's not going to alter the wording of the UDHR. But it's illustrative of what is happening. And so here's the provocative part of it, after having said that, about the backstepping of the United States on the grand tradition of 1948, is also what's been happening with the representation of India in the Human Rights Council, the statements that I think you've commented on in the press of the uh, representative of India to the United Nations um, take challenging some fundamental processes of the United Nations, and as you've dealt with a lot in your own work, uh, the position of India in the Universal Periodic Review. So my question then is this. India, Americans, French, Latin Americans, Chinese, even Soviets, wasn't mentioned at all, have, a great have made a great contribution to this charter for humanity that Upendra actually has written about so eloquently, an inaugural document for the, for the human rights uh, as part of the world order. But what is happening to our two countries now after that great leadership when we find the most flagrant um, backward movements of challenging the procedures of the United Nations by the Indian representative, of withdrawing from the Human Rights Council by the United States representative. Where are we heading, you know? mindfulness of India's position, particularly the India's very progressive position on the right to self-determination and the two covenants. However, when we ratified the convention in 79, we had very strong reservations put on this. And today, 
in many situations, like in my own situation, we are seeing that the very discourse on human rights has been heavily criminalized. And in fact, uh, if you start talking about self-determination in certain parts of this country, uh, terrorist laws like the Unlawful Activity Prevention Act can clamp down heavily. This complete U-turn of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of position, how do you see it? Uh, it will be interesting to see how we have completely changed uh, over the last uh, 70 years. Every tradition that was made here, comment, is very important. But I have to assure you that you don't have to respond to everyone. Some of them they are necessary to think back on. But you have about another 30 minutes to complete your uh, response to our friend here. Uh, I thought I would give an opportunity to. Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, as you know, that. Uh, Article 19 of the UNHCR has uh, uh, deals with the freedom of expression, speech and expression, which we have incorporated in our Article 19. And this handout on facts and figures, uh, you know, provokes me to make a comment, which may, which may be a takeaway of, of this event. Freedom of expression. 101 journalists were killed in the pursuit of a story in 2016 which on average constitutes one casualty every four days. And even in India, there are numerous journalists whose lives have been uh, you know, taken away, they've been attacked, and yet, if we, as a democratic country, who have incorporated Article 19 into our constitution, do not have enough protection of this, which is central to the idea of democracy as a whole. If I, hello. We also have some questions that are coming on Twitter. So if I may take this opportunity of very quickly reading them out to you. Ravi Kapoor asks, are states that were not members of the United Nations when the UDHR was signed legally bound to respect it? Then we have two other questions. Ark Ved asks, what do you think India should focus on most to stand up for human rights? And the last one, Sushil Kashyap, more as an Indian, what can I do to stand up for human rights? Thank you. Did I stand up? Um, I, I was hoping you would help me with these questions, okay, because some of them are, uh, you know, quite complex. Um, just, just very quickly to respond to Hindu's uh, question, questioning on, on uh, the idea of this work. Uh, it was just as a, as a person who was very passionate about human rights, who always believed in the universality of human rights. When I came across uh, one or two articles about India's contribution, I, I just wanted to uh, pursue it further. And having had the opportunity to have access to um, primary material at the UN in Geneva, as I mentioned, the, the more I dug, the more I found. So it was really a labor of love. And I was very proud um, that we, as Indians, had made this contribution. Um, um, it, it, in terms of the, the question that uh, Sir Merchant was asking about the dehumanization, um, I, I think for a lot of these questions, the answer uh, is really not to be um, despondent, uh, not to be depressed. Uh, but when I travel around the world today, and I, I do a lot of training on human rights work, um, I find even in the most authoritarian countries that there are movements, there are people, human rights defenders who are actually standing up for their rights, who are at great risk uh, to their lives, um, their families um, are continuing to fight. Um, and, and I think that uh, that even though we may be you know, quite despondent about the position that India takes, and that's one of the questions, I, I think it's a very sort of ambivalent issue because India also, at the same time, uh, was a great supporter of the Universal Periodic Review, which is helping many of us in the country today uh, fight for human rights and to look for results. India is also still a firm believer in the multilateral process. Uh, the climate meeting that just started today in Poland, India is taking very progressive positions. So I, I don't think that, uh, and, and a question that Stephen Marx was saying, I, I don't think, I, mean, I don't think that we have withdrawn um, the way in which uh, 
what the United States has. Um, we are still very much there, and I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to, I, you know, when Nikki Haley was making those statements, I was tempted to write an op-ed uh, saying that we should, as Indians, disown Nikki Haley because nothing she says has any resonance of what we, as Indians, uh, as Indians uh, stand for. Uh, to Yuri's question about the dynamism, the dynamic between the great powers in India, um, it's very interesting because when the UDHR drafting was, uh, had begun, there was still war going on. There were still countries. And it's amazing to me when I read the official records that there were people sitting around the table who were actually at war with each other, who were still able, as I mentioned, what came out of the UNESCO study, were still able to say that, okay, let's put our differences aside because we do not want to repeat uh, this mistake and we, we need to come together. And the dynamic between the United Kingdom and India is very interesting because when the drafting started, we were still under British occupation. And it's, it's very interesting, as the drafting in, uh, evolved, actually some of the articles that I presented, um, the articles were drafted jointly by the United Kingdom and India. So, so there was a, you know, a rapprochement. Um, but, but the, um, so, so I don't know, I, I, you know, sometimes when I was doing this work, I was reflecting that suppose we didn't have the Universal Declaration. I mean, do we have the, the courage and the will in the world today to sit around the table and draft a document like this? I don't know. I mean, it's an open question. Uh, but, but I think that, again, I would stress that there is so much material there that we all need to be, not only learn from, but be inspired. And we need to hang on to the fantastic work that was done at the UN, continues to be done. You know, many of the countries, as one Twitter question, but many of the countries that were not independent at that time, the subsequent years when the um, different instruments were drafted and this you know, huge machinery at the UN now that works, the human rights system, uh, you know, at that time they envisaged that. They envisaged what we have today as the Universal Periodic Review. They envisaged that there would be a T03 and an optional protocol and a complaint process. And I think that at one level we are building that. We, we have a lot of places where as human rights defenders we can go. Uh, and and there, is, there is tremendous, uh, as I said, there, there's tremendous resource and, and movement at the, at the grassroots level to fight for, for rights. Um, Babu was just in Guwahati a few, weeks, a few days ago. We did a two-day training on land grabbing and mining and all that. And it's amazing how many your colleagues uh, are, are fighting for their rights. Um, so I think it's important that all those people who are doing that uh, have with them these tools and have with them these this repository, incredible repository of ideas and that uh, we go forward with that. I, I, I can say more, but I would really like to hear, uh, I primarily came here today to hear Professor Bakshi, so if we can please uh, give him some time. Thank you. It's very kind of you, but I don't have much to say, and that's why it's not taking a long time not saying it. Thank you indeed. I agree with Milon partly, uh, partly with Steve and others who said that it's a very uh, kind of tragic moment for talking about human rights and struggles and so on. So we are going backwards. In fact, I gave a talk the other day, oh, a year ago. But look like we're away, on whether the whole world is becoming a fourth world, a third world in a pejorative sense. The evacuation of liberal values from the land of enlightenment <coughs> is now a reality. That is Europe and America. And one can go on. At the same time, the puzzle that belongs present remains, namely, the puzzle of uh, when the superstructure crumbles, grassroots arise. So we don't have a, a, a universal declaration of human rights type movement or human rights movement in general at the superstructure level, at the level of elites, at the level of state, at even the level of many fancy uh, escort of NGOs. But we have a rising movement on the ground for human rights. 
But it's a very curious situation, and click a lot of founders in cipher. Uh, where to, uh, where, uh, how to read this uh, increase in grassroots movements at the very time, at the very same time when the superstructure support is coupling for human rights. And I think that requires a lot of uh, thought. I would uh, simply, uh, well, I'll, I'll not take too much of the time, but I would simply say, uh, and I've got somewhere uh, in, in writing, so you can have it, anybody wants it, uh, you can write to Bello, and I would uh, give a copy. Uh, essentially, what I want to say is, uh, I'm a little, I, supposing I were to say that Hansa Mehta was a pre-feminist feminist, and he's a pre-first-way feminist, in, in the sense that contributions are immense. Uh, would you have, uh, would you, would you have did with uh, our dear friend Judy here when it talks about ladies and gentlemen? Because it uh, classifies humankind into two those who are men and those who are women. And feminism always goes against it. So, in a sense, uh, nowadays there is a transgender movement, movement and we recognize rights in India too. And therefore, uh, even going beyond feminism. So my subject for it is, is gentle persons. I'm addressing all of you as gentle persons, not as ladies and gentlemen. But Hansa Mehta was feminist, but also a careful woman on representation. Because she did not object to the preamble of the UN as a child of gravity. She went to family. In Cedo also there is a reference to family and primacy of family values and women did not object to it. So there is a very interesting area of feminism and human rights or third gender and human rights that we need to contemplate. Uh, essentially my, my queries are following. One, you refer to Congress Resolution 1942, 42, I think, yeah, which ends by saying that uh, the that Indian independence movement is in no way selfish. I get it from the paper. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is an independence movement, all right, but it is also an internationalist movement in character. And you want a world federation, like UN, which eventually became UN, which you, somebody just said, you have compromise for a, but maybe it's something more than that. So, my query is asked, what was the role of any of Mondas in adopting this resolution? Or was he associated for? Second, were all anti-colonial movements of the same view as India? Very many didn't appreciate international cosmopolitan altruism. They wanted to have independence and that's it. Uh, maybe. How does UH, UDHR and its own progeny fulfill the aims of Indian conception of World Federation? And there are very, very many questions that arise. What are the patterns of continuity and discontinuity that somebody referred to in India's leadership today as far as, you, as, far as human rights? And most importantly, has India developed by its interventions at the UDHR and elsewhere, have we developed a concept of cosmopolitan global justice, which houses human rights? And did Hansa Mehta pioneer such concept? In fact, there is a lot that can be said about the contribution in that light, in the light of uh, theory of global justice. Second, Statement I discussed with Bellon, but in the time for it, I raise the query again. The most important phrase in Mandar's Gandhi's letter to Julian Huxley, nine months or so before his tragic assassination, was the phrase citizens of the world. The rights are reserved and reserved all citizens of the world. And my question is the 1988 General Assembly Resolution on Universal Duties and Rights of 
people and saints. Does it at all accord with Monas' conception? Has the UN moved in the direction of duty, which I heavily uh, urged uh, at the other time? The third was uh, the response of the party government. I think uh, it's a bit, which uh, uh, I think, of, uh, uh, characterized uh, colonialism as a, as a menace to mankind, humankind. And uh, she, she referred to uh, uh, Kessler's manage, uh, refer to uh, colonialism as an as a, as a object which of repression, a subject of repression. How did other people, as the UNP or DHR, I can't remember the I have a love hate relationship with Acrodentist. And UN is the largest producer of Acrodentist. And therefore, I, I, I it tumbled very often. And I call them oxymorons, <laughs> like oxymorons. So you understand? But I'm referring to human rights situation, whatever it is. So it is, it is, the question is uh, how far the substitute value, the non euro values, carried the day, and how far they evolved. The non euro values were. Founded by Mansa Bhatta, by Ambedkar, by whatever it is, and other people. The Indian, the Buddhist uh, notion, they mentioned 10 values. How far did the populace? Is, is the thesis one that Western, that the UDHR perpetuates a human rights imperialism of the European? over the rest of the world. Is that version correct? Or is there a way of saying that if you look at the early drafting of this declaration, you will find that there are values which resonate today in the world of the in, in the development ahead, where these values will be. So how can you bring the past into future? That's the question that one could raise. Uh, and uh, finally, I would simply say something many things. Uh, uh, oh, I leave it there. I leave it there. Finally, I would say, what, I'll say one thing. You open up a space, perhaps it is already opened up by some other people, but you open it particularly by talking about India as to whether other nations have set their own contribution to the making of this declaration. And how far they agree or disagree with India in the making. So it would it would be it's an ongoing process. <laughs> the I did some uh, idle chapter it's called Bakwas in Urdu. I did some Bakwas on the sixtieth anniversary of human rights with uh, Serene Abadi and others in Emory. And I remember that I remember saying there might not be 70th anniversary of human rights. I'm so delighted to be proved wrong. I said in the light of Bhopal, and I still say I'm always wrong, I'm happy to be wrong. But how long will this declaration survive? Is the anxiety that many of us have. And in answering to that particular question, what is the value of Indian non-euro contribution to the making of UDHR and how they can import back again on the table? Thank you again.
the UDHR resonates very much. And, and, and I think that that is really the hope today. I, I don't you know, allow myself to be caught up in these political debates and people being, as I mentioned, despondent. I, I still see a lot of hope in the world. I still see a lot of people fighting on the ground, a lot of people, as I mentioned, risking their lives. But, but using, what, what is very inspiring for me is that people are using the UDHR and other human rights instruments as their inspiration, as, their, as the basis of their claims uh, to the UN. And I, I also don't think that uh, there is any crumbling of the human rights structure at the UN. In fact, the structure keeps getting stronger. As I mentioned, if you do a review of the last you know, 10, 12 years of work of the Universal Periodic Review, we have seen changes even in authoritarian uh, countries. And, and so I think there is a, and, and it has allowed for national coalitions of groups to come together, just like in India. And I think the pedagogical value of the UDHR is enormous because people, and that's the difference I have seen in my 30 years of work on the human rights, that there are so many people, millions of people, thousands of people who are working on human rights on the basis of the UDHR. So I, I very much, and I sincerely believe in that, I want, very much want to end on a positive note, and I think it's sort of incumbent on all of us to contribute to that work and to carry forward the messages that uh, we have, you know, the, the fortune to have uh, received and imbibed from our great uh, freedom fighters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we uh, till we meet again next year. Thank you.